Hello, everybody. Um, I'm I'm recording this uh, the Friday before EmberConf. Unfortunately, of course, I I couldn't come to Portland as I I did in the past like, five years or so. Uh, first time, first time I'm speaking, and first time I'm not actually there um, at the same time, which is unfortunate. But I guess this is kind of a special situation, obviously. So. Um, I don't have proper recording equipment here, but I hope uh, this is going to be going to be good. Um, and uh, let's get started. So, uh, welcome to my to my bonus conf talk, uh, uh, decorators in depth. I'm uh, Marco. I'm from from Germany, specifically Bavaria, where people sometimes look like this. Uh, I am the founder of uh, Simple Apps. We're a um, a web engineering consultancy. We build digital uh, products for companies around the world, uh, and we also help teams uh, to be uh, like more effective with with Ember, deliver better quality in a uh, shorter time, maybe, uh, and and just uh, sort of to to get the most out of Ember. Um, and you might know us from our uh, open source work. We maintain a bunch of like, uh, well-known um, add-ons in the Ember ecosystem. Uh, we also sponsor the Ember project as such with people uh, writing for the Ember Times, uh, for example. Uh, we did a lot of work on the website. Uh, we have people on the learning team um, and so on. Uh, and we co-organize Emberfest, which is Europe's uh, Ember conference, obviously. And uh, my notes say here I brought stickers. I didn't actually bring them, obviously. I I think I sent 800 to Portland, which I don't know, are maybe now in the Tilde office, and like maybe we can distribute them some other way. Uh, but here's how the sticker. Um, looks for this year and the dates for this year are going to be October 15, 16. Uh, we don't actually say what the host city of the conference is. Uh, as every year, sort of, we have this uh, sticker with a background that sort of gives some, some visual hints on the location. And then we let people guess it's like our poor man's marketing strategy. Uh, I think it worked pretty well in the last years. Um, and, uh, yeah, see whether somebody, uh, uh, let's see whether somebody can guess this year's, uh, host city. We will, of course, reveal it, um, soon, but I guess at the moment it's not even clear whether everybody will be able to travel anywhere in Europe in mid-October. Hopefully, yes, but, um, we will hold off a bit until the, the situation, uh, smooths a bit more. Um, so I have some, uh, opening story for the talk, which doesn't really work anymore. I'm still going to do it though, because I, I couldn't really come up with anything better. Um, so this is actually, like I said in the beginning, it's the first time I speak at EmberConf, right? And the joke that I want to make is that it's the first time that I'm speaking and I almost didn't make it to Portland. Now, of course, I actually didn't make it to Portland, but let's still sort of go through the story. Um, because uh, besides Corona, there's actually another reason why I would almost not have made it to Portland if Corona hadn't happened um, um, at all. And that has to do with this uh, thing, the electronic system for travel authorization, uh, called ESTA, which is what uh, um, all of the non, uh, um, the, the non-Americans or Europeans, or so I don't really know like, to who it applies, but everybody from Europe uh, has to uh, sort of go through this system sort of to register um, with their, with their like, passport number and so on before they can go to the US, right? And then that gets approved and then you can go into the country without a visa. Um, and in order to go through this, you have to answer all kinds of questions. Like one question is, uh, have you ever violated any law related to, to uh, possessing, using or distributing illegal drugs, which I don't know, uh, uh, this might be the one where like many people would actually lie, I guess. 
uh, there's also other questions like do you seek to engage in or have you ever engaged in terrorist activities espionage sabotage or genocide which i guess or hope most people can actually honestly um din uh, uh um, um um answer negatively right uh but there's also a new question since i think summer last year and that is have you traveled to or being present in Iran, Iraq, Libya, North Korea, Somalia, Sudan, and so on after 2011, after March 2011. And the problem is, uh, here's a picture of me in North Korea in 2012. Uh, here's me, here's a statue of, I think, Kim Il-sung, and here's a bunch of flowers that I just had, had dropped in front of that statue. Um, and I should say that it's not actually sort of me expressing my support for the regime uh it's just something that you're sort of expected to do when you're there uh so i answered that new question honestly and uh not surprisingly my travel to the us was not authorized so now i need to get a visa uh which is actually a good thing because now i have to i have a 10 year uh, visa and I don't have to go through ESTA anymore. And somebody told me I would have been able to sort of add, add immigration, take like a faster lane or so. I might find that out next year. Um, and uh, uh, getting the visa was really easy. Uh, uh, the person at the embassy found it pretty convincing that I uh, went to North Korea for vacation. Um, but yeah, having the visa doesn't help me now, of course, right? Um, and of course, it's not really up to me sort of to judge US policy, but I'm not sure it's fair that I need a visa now because they only be, uh, because I have been to North Korea once because um, here's me in my guide in, in North Korea, that's Mr. Kim. Uh, obviously, in North Korea, you cannot do anything without a guide, right? And the guide is not actually a guide, it's more like a uh, a person that's watching you, right? And they are, um, are being watched themselves, right? Uh, but the thing is, I don't seem to be the only one maintaining relatively close relationships uh, uh, with North Koreans, right? So it seems a bit like there's different rules for different people here. Um, although I will admit that I uh, did not fall in love with Mr. Kim over beautiful letters, but just over beers, as people do. Um, it's like maybe a bit of double standards here. Uh, so anyway, I, I thought this might be, be a good opening story for the talk. Um, now, as I said, sort of it doesn't work anymore really because now I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in Munich, but um, so like having added that story to the talk, I thought like maybe there's a way sort of connecting the, the talk's main topic, which is obviously not uh, North Korea, but uh, JavaScript decorators. Like connecting the two topics a bit, right? And having sort of a JavaScript decorator slash North Korea talk. Um, and then I was uh, thinking about how I could do that. And the first thought I had is just this statement, which sounds pretty nice, right? Decorators are the North Korea of JavaScript. But what does that even mean, right? It's basically, it's basically just a a bullshit statement that sounds very good, but it means nothing. So unfortunately, there will be no more North Korea content in this talk, uh, just because I couldn't find a proper way to to get it in. Um, but back to the topic, and I want to start with uh, some theory. So the theory behind something like JavaScript decorators um, is uh, attribute-oriented programming. Uh, and the idea behind attribute-oriented uh, programming is that it is a program-level marking technique that allows you to mark elements in your program to indicate that they maintain specific, like application-specific or domain-specific semantics without leaking all of the details of those semantics into your core logic, so to say. Uh, which then increases abstraction and reduces complexity, right? And um, many languages have had similar, concept, uh, uh, similar concepts for quite some time. Uh, for example, in, in Java, you have attributes uh, like deprecated, which allows you 
to mark a specific thing in in your code, like a class here, as deprecated. Um, of course, you could also do more sophisticated stuff. Um, so here's an example from uh, Hibernate, which is a very popular ob object relational mapper in in Java. Uh, and here you see we use the uh, uh, we use the entity attribute and the table attribute, ID attribute, and so on. Uh, to sort of define um, how the mapping uh, from instances of the employee class to a particular database table should work or other way around as well, of course. Um, but the thing here is we are not leaking any of the details, like any of the uh, sort of internal mechanisms of this mapping into the application code, right? We keep it relatively clean because we just sort of attribute the elements uh, with the respect uh, with the respective attributes uh, without sort of revealing how those work internally. Um, uh, uh, this concept doesn't only exist in in Java, though. There's also uh, a similar con. Uh, a concept in .NET. Uh, so here, for example, we're using JSON property attributes to um, to uh, define how instances of a, a particular class, and in this case, the um, API error class, are uh, serialized to JSON. Um, and again, without leaking any of the details of the serialization process, sort of into our application code. Um, when we compare this to what we have in Octane, then uh, it's obviously similar, right? So here we use the track decorator to mark the count property as track. So the template re-renders when it changes. Uh, and we use the action decorator to make the increment and decrement methods work as actions. So um, again, without leaking any of the details uh, of these decorators or or the concepts behind them into our application code right we just say the count property should be tracked we don't care about how how that works internally or what the, what uh, tracking even means sort of that's not a concern of our application but that's a framework concern so there's no point sort of leaking leaking any of the details uh, um, of the concept of uh, tracking or the concept of making a method available as an act or work as an action uh, into our application code. So we want to hide all of that and we do hide all of it behind that decorator. Um, so this is uh, how JavaScript decorators fit in to sort of the general concept of attribute oriented uh, programming. So you add attributes to the code to express additional semantics while hiding all of the details. Um, but later we will see there's actually a fundamental difference uh, between JavaScript decorators and attributes in other languages. Uh, we will look into that in more detail later. Um, sort of on the surface, on the surface it's uh, sort of the same thing. And it's it's meant to serve the same purpose. Um, the the insights sort of are a bit, are a bit different, but uh, for now we can ignore that. So then you might ask, uh, are decorators ready for use? And the answer is is it's uh, complicated, unfortunately. Uh, and again, I want to uh, share some background here. So as most of you know, or Everybody, uh, presumably, uh, TC39 is the group that defines the ECMAScript script uh, standard, and that's JavaScript. Um, it's an international group of people with various backgrounds, uh, sort of, uh, that represent different interest groups, like larger companies, uh, browser makers, and so on, but also sort of uh, the viewpoint of the average JavaScript developer, uh, sort of, which I think uh, was one of the main motivations for Yehuda Katz, like, obviously, as you know, one of the sort of inventors of Ember uh, to join TC39, because I I think 
uh, that his motivation sort of was to make sure that the 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 average JavaScript developer's viewpoint sort of was uh, recognized in TC39 as well, and not only the interests of larger companies or browser makers, because sometimes those could be those could be um, uh, 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 pretty different, of course. So that group of international people discusses ideas for additions and changes to the spec, or I guess in reality, it's really additions only because you cannot change anything in JavaScript. And it's, it's basically an additive uh, spec because changing anything would break existing uh, code and websites. Um, so each new thing that they discuss uh, goes through five stages. Uh, in stage zero, the thing is basically just an idea uh, for a new language feature. Um, so anybody could have that idea. And then when you find a TC39 member to bring it to the group, uh, then it it would get discussed there, right? At that point, the idea would usually be pretty vague. There's no indication of whether it'll go forward at all, or maybe like it's being discussed for five minutes and then immediately rejected for some reason or whatever, right? Uh, the next stage then is stage one, where you have a written proposal with proper description, examples, and so on, discussions of semantics. Um, and there's a TC39 member that uh, champions the idea, sort of, right, or the proposal. Uh, so stage one means that uh, TC39 is willing to, ex uh, to examine, discuss, and contribute to the proposal. Um, but there are still major changes to be expected, right? At that point, it's still relatively vague, and there's no indication of whether it'll make it into the spec eventually or... Uh, if it makes it, uh, whether that's going to be a very different form, maybe... Uh, but um, the, if it's not rejected, then the next stage uh, will be stage two. Uh, at uh, that stage, the uh, proposal must have a formal syntax definition. Description should be complete. There should be, or there need to be, I think, two experimental implementations. Uh, one will usually be Babel, unless the feature cannot be transpired to current JavaScript. Sort of. I, um, I think that was the case with uh, proxies, because there's no way sort of to make the underlying mechanism of proxies work with 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 current JavaScript. Um, obviously, experimental um, implementations can of course be in browsers as well, behind feature flags or whatever. Um, at stage two, a proposal can still be rejected. So it's 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 relatively far in the process, but there's still no no guarantee um, it'll make it. Uh, the next stage then is uh, stage three, at which uh, point the spec text uh, needs to be complete. There need uh, need to be full. Uh, there need to be two fully compliant implementations. Again, one of them would usually be Babel. Um, and at this point, the proposal can be expected to be added to the spec, and changes should only uh, be made when critical issues occur. Um, and that's why stage three is sort of the important stage, right? Because at stage uh, three, you can expect the thing to be added uh, to the uh, spec eventually in only slightly modified form. So uh, stage three proposals are pretty okay to use in general, right? While everything, everything before or below stage three is not really okay to be used because there's no guarantee it will actually make it to the spec and there's no guarantee that if it makes it to the spec it will be in the form that like, like in its current form sort of right um so uh yeah stage three is the one that you want to keep in mind because that's sort of when uh you you're building on relatively solid ground sort of if you're using something in stage three um, the next stage is then uh, stage four, which is basically just like, like uh, a, a stage uh, that something goes into while it's sort of waiting to be added, but it's already decided that it will be added, right? So, uh, um, of course, now the question is, um, where are we with uh, JavaScript decorators? And first problem is there's not one, but actually two proposals. Second problem is one is in stage one and the other is in stage 
two, and obviously that means that none of them is final or complete, right? Um, the stage one proposal is basically deprecated, sort of, that's going, uh, uh, not going to be continued. And the stage one, uh, uh, the stage two proposal is in stage two, which means it's not done, right? It might still change uh, relatively significantly. Um, so let's look at some more details of those two proposals. Uh, first of all, the stage one uh, uh, proposal, which basically defines decorators as simple functions. Right? You would just write a function that receives the element that you're decorating, and then you can modify the element, um, which is very simple, right? Uh, but it has major implications with respect to performance because um, you're actually modifying the class or the method or the property or whatever. Um, so you're changing the shape of things uh, sort of, which is always very bad for um, for browser engines uh, to optimize, right? So there are major performance impl um, implications. Uh, there are also major tooling implications because you cannot actually statically and you cannot actually statically analyze those decorators, right? If a class is decorated with a stage one decorator, you cannot really know what that decorator does so you might not know for sure which uh, uh, which methods that class has right or whether the methods are actually as you see them in the class body or whether the decorator does modify them and then like like the actual methods on instances or on the prototype will actually be different from what you're seeing right so um, that's of course a major problem as well, in particular, uh, for tooling, right? Um, so the stage two proposal solves the performance and tooling problems by um, basically defining decorators as first class language elements and sort of limiting them much more, but um, it's not ready yet. There are major changes to be expected, so it's not even really clear how exactly that's going to look, right? Uh, so coming back to my previous slide uh, here, in reality, decorators are not the North Korea of JavaScript, but sort of the anti-North Korea of JavaScript, because nothing is regulated and everybody can do what they want, basically, because there is no official regulation or specification, right? Um, so the question is, what do we do? The old thing is deprecated and the new thing is not ready. But in Ember, we need something that, uh, 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 that works well with native classes because the old macro methods that we've been using for computer properties, for example, and so on, they don't really work well with native classes. Uh, you have a bunch of options using them with native classes, so it, it's not impossible to use them. I think there might be some edge cases where they actually behave differently, but it's it's not impossible to use them. It's just n not nice at all. So, uh, for example, if you had a person class with a first name and last name, uh, and uh, by the way, uh, all those examples are, I think, taken from the IFC that I think uh, Melanie Sumner wrote. I'm not 100% sure, but uh, the examples have her name, of, um, obviously, so uh, let's just assume she wrote it. Um, so if you have a person class here with a first name and last name, and you want to define a like the, the typical uh, full name computer property, right? Like full name must be a sort of the hello world of computer properties, I guess. Uh, then with a native class, you could define the class first and then on the prototype, define the computer property, right? Which is obviously not what you actually want to do in, uh, in, in your in application. The alternative is you sort of mix uh, like new native classes and the old Ember object model and you define the, the class as an extension of sort of an anonymous uh, class here that uh, where you um, use the old way sort of, of extending from Ember object. This works, but it's obviously also not 
really nice, right? The, uh, uh, the best solution is obviously with decorators, right? Where you just define define a proper native class with with two uh, fields and one getter, and you just decorate the getter with the computed uh, decorator, yeah. Right. So uh, the question is, how do we get that when the decorator's proposal is not ready, really? Uh, and the answer is, we just stick with the stage one proposal for now. This is what the uh, TC39 champion group recommends, um, because although uh, the specification is not ready, uh, decorators are already widely used in the JavaScript community. Um, and Ember is actually relatively late to the party here. So um, projects like Angular also have used decorators for years now. Um, so there's a lot of pressure and also there's commitment, I, I think from TC39 to make the final uh, decorator proposal so that it will allow to do the, uh, uh, to make the final decorator proposal so that it, it will allow for doing the same things with decorators that you can also do with stage one decorators. Uh, so that means you will very likely not have to change your uh, usages of decorators, right? Uh, the decorators will only have to change internally to solve the performance and tooling problems, but that also, means that you do not want to write your own decorators yet because um, while sort of uh, while usages of decorators will not have to change the internals of decorators will change a lot uh, potentially so you uh, when writing decorators you're building on pretty unstable ground right um, if you only use uh, if you only use the decorators that Ember provides, then obviously Ember sort of shields you from all of the internal changes that uh, uh, might or will probably have to uh, uh, to be made at some point. The computed property, uh, the computed decorator, and the track decorator will continue to work the same way. They will just be um, implemented in a very different way internally. Um, one thing though is that um, in app code, you would usually, uh, but there's usually not such good use cases for decorators anyway, because as we saw in the beginning, the purpose of a decorator is sort of making something available while hiding all of the details of that, right? Um, which is usually not something that you want to do in an application, right? Because in an application, you don't want to sort of hide parts of the code from 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 the uh, the engineer because all of your application code as a whole sort of uh, is being maintained by your project team and so on. So you like, like you don't want to um, um, introduce black boxes, right? Um, it is, however, of course, something that has a lot of value for frameworks like Ember or maybe even for add-ons. Uh, and understanding what uh, decorators do, how they work, uh, what they can do, what they can't do, sort of gives you a better mental model of your application, of course, which is also the reason why I give this talk. Uh, so let's look at the stage one proposal in more detail. We will basically ignore the stage two proposal for now because um, it's unclear how it's it's going to work eventually. So we will focus on the stage one proposal. And, and like I said, the stage one proposal defines decorators as simple functions that modify the element that they're decorating. And that is also coming back to a previous point, that is that main difference between JavaScript decorators and attributes in java.net because while attributes in Java and .NET only add metadata sort of to the elements that they're attributing, um, JavaScript decorators actually modify these elements, right? So um, with a JavaScript decorator, you could actually modify a class, for example, where 
uh, why uh, an attribute in .NET will only add metadata to that class so that at runtime you could reflect over that metadata and sort of do certain things then, um, right? So that might, of course, be different in the stage two proposal, but for now, that's really the main difference that a JavaScript decorator will actually modify the th thing that it is decorating. Um, and um, doing that though is relatively simple. There's basically two cases. Uh, there's the case where you are decorating a class. And in that case, the decorator is a simple function that receives the class constructor as its argument. Uh, you could also, of course, decorate a class member, in which case the arguments uh, for that are the prototype, uh, the name of the member, and a property descriptor for the, uh, yeah, for the property you are, you are decorating. And, and I want to show you some concrete examples to make that a bit clearer. Um, I have created a little example app, uh, so you can uh, find all of the code on, on Gitter. Um, and uh, let's look at the first one. So uh, here we have a simple mbar route, right? We just uh, load some data from an API endpoint. We don't care about the details, of course. And now let's assume we want to benchmark that, right? We want to like, like have something in, in place that allows us to benchmark the execution time and maybe report it somewhere or whatever. But of course, we don't want to sort of have all of the benchmarking code as such in the route, right? We want to hide that because it's not relevant to the application, really, right? Let's say we want to like make a benchmarking add-on or whatever. Um, so a good way to do that, of course, is to use a decorator, as we're doing here, right? We're just importing that as any other thing sort of in JavaScript, and then we're decorating the model method. Uh, and as I said uh, before, the uh, decorator uh, using the stage one proposal, the decorator is just a simple function that takes the uh, the prototype, the property name, and the property descriptor for the property we're decorating as arguments. And what we're doing here is we're simply remembering the original value of the property descriptor, which is the original implementation of that method, and then we replace it with a wrapper. Right, and here what we're doing is uh, we stop the time when we start execution, then we call the original method. We stop the time when that ends, and we log that to the console. In reality, you might be logging to some sort of API or whatever, and then we return the 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 result that we got from the original method. Right, so we do not um, we do not change the original method. We also don't change the signature of the method uh, because the, the method that we are uh, replacing the original one with has the same signature, right? We're just adding our stuff sort of before and after the original method. Um, and that also means, of course, that the original model method doesn't even have to know that it is being benchmarked or that it is like wrapped with something else, right? which is the point of a decorator, of course. Um, another example is uh, this one here. So let's assume besides benchmarking the model method, we also want to require um, users to be logged in to have access to that route at all. And by the way, this is a sneak preview sort of of what and a version of Ember Simple Auth, which uh, we at Simple Apps maintain, uh, without mixins can look like, right? You can use mixins with um, native classes like relatively easily in Ember, but it's not really, it's not really great, right? Um, so um, in the current version of Ember Simple Auth, you would just mix in the authenticated route mixin into this route that you're defining here. Um, but with a decorator, it's even a bit nicer and sort of has a has a more modern look as well. <laughs> uh, so what we do here is we just import the authenticated decorator and apply it to the route class, right? Uh, and again, the decorator is a simple function that takes the class con constructor as an argument, and we do a similar thing 
uh, here to to what we did be, uh, um, before. We we remember sort of the original implementation of the classes before model method, uh, and then we replace it with our own method. And what we do in that method is we get a session or the session service. Uh, we check whether the user is logged in. If it's not the case, we just transition them somewhere else. In this case here to index would probably make more sense to transition them to the login uh, route. And if they are logged in and there's an original implementation of before model, we just call that, right? So again, we are adding sort of relatively a uh, complex logic with a very s simple mechanism and we are hiding all of the details. We don't change the original before model method. Um, so I think this is a, um, a very um, nice example for um, how uh, decorators are actually a pretty good way uh, of making making uh, functionality in add-ons available for Ember applications. Um, obviously, those examples are sort of made up. They don't really have any sort of real value. It's, um, it's just for, for illustration purposes here. Uh, so I also want to look at two examples from Ember itself. And if we look at this, uh, 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 this piece of code here from previously, um, Again, with a component that has a track property uh, called count, and then two methods that we decorate with the action decorator, so we can actually call them as actions uh, from the template. Um, so uh, how does this work? And uh, first of all, let's look at the track decorator. And uh, this is not really the the uh, uh, the code from the Glimmer code base, it's sort of the essence of the code, right? Um, but here you see that we have a function here that takes the uh, the prototype, the um, uh, property name and the property descriptor as arguments, right? Uh, because it's a, a stage one decorator applied to a class member. And what it does is a very similar thing to what uh, what we saw before, it replaces the original uh, property with, uh, in this case here, a, a getter and a setter. We can ignore the getter, that's not so interesting, but the thing, of course, about computer, uh, about uh, track properties is that uh, whenever a track property is modified, then the template re-renders, right? And you see how that works here in the uh, setter, where uh, whenever the the um, the property is set, uh, the property to change uh, callback will be called, which is sort of an internal callback in Glimmer, which um, which uh, sort of triggers a re-render, right? So that is basically how the track decorator in inside of Glimmer works. It, it, it just replaces your original property with sort of a wrapper property that will make sure that whenever the property is set and internal callbacks are, are sort of in Glimmer is called, uh, which will then uh, trigger a re-render. Uh, next, uh, next, let's look at action. And as you all know, the main thing about actions is that uh, they are, um, 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 are closures that are already sort of pre-bound to the correct context, right? So you can just call them as a function and they will uh, be running with the correct this binding uh, sort of, right? So basically, besides a bunch of other things, like you see the dotted lines here basically are like relatively big parts of actual code that are left out here, but uh, sort of one of the main things that the action decorator does is it just it binds the method you're decorating and assigns it to a, a hash of actions, right? And that allows you then to use uh, like like the method as an action from the template. Um, so uh, this is decorators 
um, in Ember. Uh, they are a great way for abstracting logic that is non-essential to your application, but that is maybe uh, only essential for the framework or only essential for some other system sort of you're using. Uh, but there's no stable spec, which means you don't want to write your own uh, unless you have lots of time and lots of willingness sort of to to uh, potentially um, rewrite lots of the internals of the decorators you're, you're writing. And uh, that's all that I um, have. Thanks. Unfortunately, I, I can't take questions. Unfortunately, I can also not talk to people sort of after the talk or in breaks or whatever, but uh, we'll repeat all of that, um, I guess, next year in Portland or uh, at Emberfest in Europe this year. Thank you. Bye-bye.